Today's discussion will be presented in three sections since we're recording it for a radio broadcast on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. You're welcome to post questions and comments during the session, and we'll try to answer them online. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Jason Miller, executive editor of federalnewsradio.com. Welcome to the discussion. My guests today are Lieutenant General Jack Shanahan, the Director for Defense Intelligence Warfighter Support in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, Margie Palmieri, the Director of Digital Warfare Office in the Office of the Chief of Naval Operations, Andrew Mansfield, the Technical Director for the Navy's Space and Naval Warfare System Center Atlantic, and Lee Madden, the General Manager of Defense for Microsoft. Welcome to the discussion today. Thank you. Let me get started with some context for our discussion. Just over a year ago, the Defense Innovation Advisory Board approved 11 recommendations to help the Defense Department stay on the cutting edge around technology, culture, operations, and processes. The 15-member board said DOD must move toward innovation by doing several things, including embracing a culture of experimentation, catalyzing innovations in artificial intelligence and machine learning, and making computer and bandwidth abundant and increase investment in new approaches to innovation. Those suggestions, in many ways, serve as the basis for our conversation today. DOD and, and really every agency must make computing and bandwidth abundant, generally through the cloud, while investing in AI machine learning to improve the speed of, to decisions and free up soldiers and civilians to do more complex work. The promise of AI at the mission level isn't lost on agencies. AI is sometimes synonymous with machine learning is being used widely in places like the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service and their Ask Emma program for their call centers. The goal of AI in many cases is to process information more quickly and make connections through data sets. But AI and machine learning in the cloud have the potential to do more than just some back, basic back office work. Over at the CIA, Teresa Smetzer, the Director of Digital Futures, said recently that AI is imperative. It's not something that's nice to have or something that agencies should consider at some point, but a technology that will help the CIA deal with an enormous exponential growth in data as well as the variety and the velocity of data. And of course, DOD sees the potential of AI machine learning on the battlefield, whether through unmanned vehicles or by cr crunching satellite data to better understand the threats and opportunities. And spending is huge. Govini predicts, a market research firm, that DOD will spend $7 billion on AI in 2017, along with big data and cloud initiatives. That's 32% increase over the last five years. So DOD, other agencies have signaled that the spending on, on and the value of AI, machine learning, other cutting edge technologies will only increase in the coming years. And again, that's a perfect place to, to go back to our panel. So we're going to start with cloud and then we'll move broader. But Andrew, I know that's your, 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 your topic. Let's start with you and a little bit about cloud. Just how are you guys within the uh, Space and Naval Warfare System Center Atlantic is using the cloud and then we'll kind of broaden that out. So it's kind of funny you say, you know, start with cloud and broaden out because I don't think there's anything more broad than cloud. <laughs> uh, cloud is IT of the 21st century. Anyone that thinks any differently, you know, isn't really paying attention. Uh, we're, so that means pretty much if you're doing IT, you're doing cloud, whether it's commercial commodity cloud or if it's something you're doing you know, internally open source or you're doing private. Uh, and so when you say, what are we doing with cloud, it's kind of like you know, everything. Everything. Right? So, but yeah, that being know, said, uh, let me bound it a little so we, we have a little bit of uh, somewhere to, to leap off from. Think of it in terms of the different service models that uh, cloud purports according to the NIST uh, guidelines, infrastructure, platform, and software as a service. Uh, we're absolutely leveraging commercial commodity cloud for all kinds of transformations on how we get that sort of broad, scalable capability, uh, leveraging, you know, basically converting all of our stuff, all of our costs to CapEx, you know, from CapEx to OpEx. Uh, I'll kind of say capital expenditures to operational expenditures so that we don't have to keep spending money on constantly upgrading, right? And we're getting the security that they provide, you know, just by buying their service. Uh, from a platform and software perspective, we're looking at back office capabilities, everything from medical to, you know, medical to, you know, office automation to data storage and things of that nature. Uh, because in addition to the, you, you mentioned, you know, uh, variety and velocity. Uh, one thing that, you know, having that much space to gives you is also the ability to kind of work veracity issues or data integrity issues. So things like that uh, where we can use the capabilities out there wholesale to, to improve what we do and how we do it. All right, so you brought up a couple different pieces to this. You brought up the, the mission side, you mm -hmm. brought up the, the back office side, and then all the different pieces. So let me turn to Margie and, and talk to you a little bit about the cloud, if you will. I know, as Andrew said, it, it's, it's the IT of the 21st century. Where does cloud fit into what you guys are doing? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we're really interested in what cloud can enable in terms of decision making and analytics. Um, when we look at the Navy, everything from our operations to readiness, um, data is a huge part of what we do. We have a, a lot of data in the Navy. Um, and how to make decisions around all that data is absolutely um, what we're focused on. And in terms of advanced analytics and artificial intelligence, not to jump too far into the future conversation, but um, you know, we're, we're seeing that if you can get the data together in a, in a environment where you can bring together different types of data. Um, so in the Navy, we tend to collect a lot of in information, a lot of data, um, but then we segment it. So we have a supply database, we have a readiness database, we have a medical database, but when we want to actually solve a problem for something, bringing that all together in a cloud environment is, is really important so that then we can write the analytics on top of it. When you talk about segment, meaning that you're going from this bunch of silos, our favorite word in government and IT, to more of a, and I'll use another kind of maybe use, often used data lake, some sort of approach where, okay, let's bring in all the data so, so whoever's doing the analytics can access different pieces and parts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's just a function, I think, of our organization. We've, we're responsible, different organizations are responsible for collecting different things, for doing different reports, but now that you can actually get predictive analytics out of things, um, being able to mash those data environments together so that you can look at how does supply really contribute to readiness, for example, um, is, is really important for us and allows us to leverage the funding we already have in uh, some of our, our other programs to, to get more use out of the data we already have. Lee, let me turn to you, because you, your focus at Microsoft is wholly on defense, I imagine, versus civilian side. And, and when you think of cloud, Microsoft, obviously, one of the biggest cloud providers. So ha asking how we're using cloud maybe is a little redundancy. But talk about what you're seeing, at least from your customers, and how are they asking for and or using, for instance, Microsoft Cloud, Azure, and, and others? Sure, I, I think we're seeing a, a typical cloud trajectory uh, in, in defense, similar to what we see commercially. Uh, we see first the, the customer using uh, productivity. In, in the case of Microsoft, it's a software as a service solution. Uh, and then at the same time, infrastructure as a service, really uh, lifting and shifting applications from an on-premises environment to the cloud. And then uh, we, we see the movement ultimately to platform as a service where there's a greater ability to derive insight from that data. And, uh, and ultimately, uh, the customer is getting to the point where they're sharing that data across applications, across platforms, and ultimately has the ability to start leveraging artificial intelligence, cognitive services, and some of the real value add capabilities that uh, come from the cloud. It's interesting you bring up the platform as a service. If you remember in, you know, back in the, when cloud was first starting to get some momentum in, in government, you know, 2010 timeframe, cloud first policy, everyone talked about platform and no one really could define what the platform was. Well, what are you talking about the platform? We know infrastructure and we know software. I, I think you just did probably the best job of defining uh, that I've heard what the platform is. is. Is that what you're seeing as well, people understanding what, what now is mean by these three separate infrastructure platform software pieces? I, I think the understanding comes with experience in the cloud. Uh, the more experienced the customers become, the more they, they see the need for moving to platform as opposed to continue to run their own infrastructure in the cloud. So it, it's definitely, uh, I think, experience-based, and that really drives the knowledge of how to best use the cloud. Andrew, jump in. Uh, from, I agree with you that platform is probably one of the most uh, overloaded terms <laughs> and vague. Uh, when I'm working as from an engineering perspective with folks on designing their service model, because that's what we're talking about, right? Uh, both from a technical and an administrative or business perspective. I kind of break platform up into two primary uh, buckets, if you will. First is what I call infrastructure platform, which speaks to how I automate, manage my deployments, how I manage my infrastructure, how I break it up into you know virtual machines or whatever. What, what quote, platform am I using to, to monitor and do system administration functions and things like that. The other aspect is the software platform, which is what do my application developers need to create code, you know, create applications for users to interact with. And so um, that's the model I use for describing platform. And you can, and yeah, vendors are gonna come up with ways in which some of that is bled over. There's never gonna be a solid line. But when you're trying to ideate around what you need to buy or how you need to architect or how you need to design, I find those being sort of two primary ways of breaking platform up into something useful. And I think it's helpful because I think, again, you're right, I think people hear platform, what does that really mean? Yeah. Uh, let me turn to uh, General Shanahan. Uh, cloud 
and, and take us down through the path of how you guys and, and your office are starting to really take advantage of all that is the cloud and, and what, where do you see kind of going? Well, with, with Project Maven, which we view as a pilot project to begin to really integrate artificial intelligence capabilities at speed and scale across the Department of Defense. You used the word earlier, imperative. We see artificial intelligence as imperative to national security, increasing operational effectiveness, lethality, and survivability. And as we've gone down this journey, for us, we didn't start with an artificial intelligence solution in search of a problem. Our problem was given to us in the form of an avalanche or tsunami of data, uh, as just, we just mentioned. In this case, full motion video. The amount of, of data coming from full motion video from unmanned aerial systems is just getting to the point where we cannot afford the number of people to look and do very l sort of labor intensive tasks associated with exploiting that that full motion video. So we, we went in search of a solution and rapidly zeroed in on artificial intelligence, in this case specifically machine learning. And as we've learned, of course, uh, one of the biggest advances on AI in the last few years, which has made it much more credible than it was in sort of the dark days of the AI winter of the 80s, is one, the amount of data is so much different, but the compute power. And for us, it's GPUs, graphics processing units, and, and other potential applications to include the cloud. We're, we're still, what I would say, on our, on our infancy in terms of putting the compute solutions together, but from the very beginning, it's GPUs, uh, largely with NVIDIA, but there are some other solutions out there, neuromorphic chips, FPGAs, A6, I mean, some bespoke solutions, but we have realized very quickly that cloud is critical to the solution. Um, cloud for training and cloud for inference. And of course, they make the distinction, the difference between cloud for storage and search capabilities, which some of the department is very d deeply invested in, but for this artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer vision, it is a different uh, arrangement. This really is cloud optimized for AI. And that's what we're beginning to take uh, advantage of right now. And you have, you have a training part, which is happening back here, and of course, uh, where, where we are in the United States. But as we begin to deploy these algorithms onto real platforms, uh, processing exploitation systems. There will be a cloud solution, but there could be some other solutions on that, on, as we say, at the tactical edge. But cloud is, there's no question in our mind that this cloud piece of what we're doing is only going to increase them in, in importance. And just in case if our audience is not as familiar with uh, Project Maven, talk a little bit about the goal of it is to take data, I mean, take video, but video data, I guess, and do what with it? And, and where are you guys at with it? Is it piloting in what way? But it is, it is just as you said, so full motion video from these unmanned aerial systems, uh, the systems are getting so good in high definition video and more sensors available to it. And the challenge is we have just run out of people. We are not going to buy our way out of this problem. In fact, as I like to say, getting more people to tackle this is actually the worst possible solution because it would keep us on old bad habit patterns. A, we, we realized that artificial intelligence would get us to a place where you could automate and augment and accelerate the analyst workflow. That in some cases uh, is very manual in terms of counting, characterizing, s staring at a video screen for 12 hours at a time, which is, which is when we describe this to the Defense Innovation Board and to industry, they, they, they were bewildered by the fact that we were spending lots and lots of hours of people's valuable time doing these manual tasks. And that's what machine learning is doing. So lots of data that we label data, process it. So the whole point is a pilot project to begin to do this across the department. As we learned when we studied what the solutions might be, there's fantastic research on AI going throughout the research laboratories. But it wasn't transitioning to the operational warfighter fast enough, and we needed a solution in the near term. And so most of this the majority of this, when it comes to these algorithms, are in commercial industry. That's, that's where the expertise is, with, with some exceptions in the research laboratories. And we went, we went out and found uh, some companies that would develop algorithms, some vendors, and we've put them on contract and are now are, are putting those very first algorithms in an operational environment. And of course, we're learning more and more every time we do this in what I would call a prototype warfare attitude. Uh, almost that s start small, stay focused, and win early which is uh, almost a Silicon Valley way of doing business, recognizing that when you field this first algorithm, which is designed to make life a lot easier for an analyst, it won't be, it won't be perfect. It will be a 75, 80, 85 percent solution, but you will rapidly optimize it and refine that algorithm. And that's the key, is this rapid optimization 
working directly with the users and not forcing a solution on them that they didn't ask for. I hope you have that on your wall somewhere. Start small, stay focused, win early. I do. And I hope so. <laughs> uh, versus uh, the one that's uh, very famous, uh, 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 trust in God, all others bring data or something. <laughs> you have that too. Uh, Margie, let me turn to you on this because you, you probably are doing some of the same things as, as the general was talking about in terms of using AI at the tactical edge, as you talked about your title of digital warfare. Talk a little bit about where that's starting to fall in, and, and, and obviously the cloud plays a role in that too. Yeah, absolutely. So for the Navy, um, you know, we go to sea. Uh, that's the, the place where uh, our operations take place most, and that's a very different environment for the cloud than uh, the traditional uh, shore-based environment. So we're definitely thinking through how do you do cloud computing at the tactical edge? A lot of uh, the sea environment involves uh, communications uncertainty. So you you may have communications at certain sometimes, and you may not at other times. And when it comes to syncing up data from shore to ship, or between ships, um, those types of architectures and, and data structures are, are more complex than it, when you can just run a landline or, or an undersea cable or something like that. Um, so we're thinking about how do, you, how do you bring cloud, and not just cloud and, and data, but also the analytic compute piece to the edge. And that's been one of the biggest um, benefits, I think, of you know, some of the, the processors and the, the storage getting smaller and lighter, uh, faster. Um, it really opens up a lot of opportunities for us in the Navy. Um, at the same time, we're also thinking about uh, the readiness side of our equation. Um, we've been looking at how we um, make better decisions around uh, part allocation and, and repair times using some of the uh, data we already have, um, just bringing that together, like I, like I said earlier, into a, a common data lake or environment. Um, and then how do you use machine learning on top of that to get more predictive, um, to get better return on investment or um, better allocation of supply across our, our tactical assets. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with Super Hornet lately. All right, so a lot there to unpack, but we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll start unpacking some of that. You're listening to the panel discussion, New Frontiers in Military Intelligence, Artificial Intelligence, Machine Learning, and the Cloud, sponsored by Microsoft on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM.